from the Grand GCQs de Montréal. Welcome to the GCN Show. Woohoo! Welcome to the GCN Show from Out of Badia in the Dolomites. This week we delve deep and take a look at how Chris Froome really won the Vuelta. At that very same race, Alberto Constor retires in some style, whilst Peter Sagan in Canada takes his 100th career victory. Not so stylish, however, is the bicycle umbrella, which we'll take a look at later. All the while, Mark Beaumont is getting ever closer to the end of his around the world adventure. We learned that Chris Froome is a modern day cannibal, more on that later on. Uh, we also learned that Alberto Condor is true to his word, and indeed to his stem, because he did indeed attack all the way to the end, and it paid off in dividends, didn't it? He won on the Angleroo, no less. Thankfully, Dan, um, that quote or phrase was on his stem cap in English, unlike the uh, slight Spanish issue that we had with your Cuera es Pode translation. Oh, yeah. A few people picked up on that. Uh, I'm not particularly good at Spanish, as you can probably tell from my pronunciation just then, but that means love is power. Love is power. Love is power. Yes, well, I'm going to blame Google Translate, uh, as well as, of course, my own Spanish. Do you mean you're non-existent that Spanish? That is the one, yeah, it is non-existent. I think the thing that I really love about Alberto Conte is when you look back at his Grand Tour results, whenever he finished on the podium of a Grand Tour, he won it. He yeah. was never second and never third. I think we're really going to miss his do or die attitude and the way he shook up every race. Yeah, he's certainly fun to watch. I think some of us are going to miss him more than others, though. Uh, in particular, I'm talking about Matt. It's the end of a bromance. Come on! Let's go! <laughs> Cheerio. Bye. All the best. Cheerio. Cheers. For f sake. Also this week, Chris Froome has done the double. In winning the Vuelta last week, as well as the Tour de France beforehand, he's become the ninth rider in history to win two Grand Tours in a single season. And in fact, the first rider to do so since Marco Pantani 19 years ago. That makes me feel very old. Yeah, imagine how it makes Matt Stevens feel. <laughs> it's a super impressive feat. I think there can be no doubt about that. But what I really want to know is how did he finally do it? Because mm. he has been trying to win this for years. Well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And I think we should firstly look at what he did before the World Tour and actually before, what, before the Tour de France itself. Because a lot has been made about how he was physically and mentally fresher going into the Tour this year. But when you delve into the stats themselves, I'm not really sure that that's the exact reason why he did so well. Yeah, I think you're right, because when you look at it, he did have his fewest number of racing days before a Tour de France win this year. So he raced for 26 days before the Tour started. But last year and in 2015, he had 27 racing days. So again, not too big a difference. 2014, he had 28. In 2013, he had 31. But then in 2012, when he was second behind then teammate Bradley Wiggins, he only had 20 days of racing, so I don't really think we can say that it is the days of racing. Mm. No, I think you're right there, and I personally would put this year's success more down to sheer determination, some very careful planning, but also some very clear goal setting, because as far as I remember, this has been the first year where Froome and Team Sky have openly declared that they want to do the double, i.e. they want to win the Tour, and they want to go on and win the World Tour. I see exactly what you're saying there, because the Vuelta, not just for Froome, but for many other Grand Tour favourites, often feels like a bit of an afterthought. The attitude is probably, well, let's see how we feel after the Tour de France and go from there. But this year, the team were very clear in their goal and they executed it. Yeah, and the team actually a very important part of Froome's success as well this year, weren't they? What we're going to have to do, though, is just give the kudos to Chris Froome that he deserves, because he's getting more and more astute as his racing years go on. And also, he's just oh so consistent. Mm. Like, whenever he has a bad day, it's not really that much of a bad day, is it? Especially compared to the bad days that his rivals have. And what that means is that he appears unbeatable in Grand Tours. Yeah, and when he gets the chance to take seconds, he always does it, doesn't he? And he also takes the chance to grab points whenever he can as well, as we learnt on Sunday. Such is his appetite for victories and wins at the moment, that he sprinted for points on the very last day, denying Matteo Trenton the green jersey and taking it for himself. Uh, and this and these results that are coming with that determination are putting Froome right up there with the best riders in history. 
I actually think he should be applauded for his cannibal-like attitude as well. Yeah, yeah, we don't criticise Merckx, do we? No. From that point of view. It's now time for Cycling Shorts. We shall start Cycling Shorts this week with some brand new Cycling shorts, and that is because Team Mobistar have already decided to release their 2018 team kit. I'm not sure what you lot think about that, but I am personally giving that a thumbs up. I like it. Yeah, let us know your thoughts though, hot or not, in the poll, which is right above Dan's head about now. More fantastic news for Mobistar for 2018 though, is the fact that, that next year they will have a women's team. Yeah. So they join the likes of fellow World Tour teams Lotto Sudel, Sunweb, Orica and F de J in having a men's team, and a women's team running on concurrent programmes. I think, you know, hopefully we'll see more teams follow in their steps. Well, let's hope so. Maybe even all teams by 2020, what do you reckon? I think parity by 2020 yeah, sounds good, doesn't crossed. it? Uh, right, on to a study that I was looking at the other day from the Swiss side aerodynamics team. Uh, take a look at this graph, uh, which puts into picture format the results that they got whilst they were in the wind tunnel recently. The remarkable thing about this, Dan, is just how similar it is to the results that you and Matt got yeah. from your GCN Does Science drafting behind the Motos video. It. That massive coincidence aside, the two kind of key takeaways from this for me were just how much of a difference drafting can make. So even if you're 10 metres behind the wheel, which is actually, incidentally, the legal distance in non-drafting triathlons, at 45 kilometers an hour in still conditions, you can save 13% of your yeah, power, which crazy. is huge. And then if you go 20 meters off the wheel in the same conditions, you're still saving 9%. Yeah, that was the one that got me because 20 meters measured out is an enormous distance. You would never think that you'd get any benefit riding Not that far behind somebody. Also though, even without anybody in front of you, if you've just got a rider sat on your wheel, you are saving over 4% in terms of your power output at 45 kilometers per hour. So next time you've got a wheel sucker sat behind you, don't bemoan them because they are actually helping you to go faster. I'm not sure they're helping you quite as much as they would be if they took the occasional turn on the well, front. No, that, that is very true, but still. I'm not going above a certain power, I've got to stay on my toes. The power that just happens to correspond with sitting in the wheels. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Coincidence. Moving from drafting to an event where drafting absolutely isn't allowed, Sarah Hammond is currently leading the Race to the Rock event over in Australia. She's covered 2,500 kilometres over rugged terrain in just over nine days at the time of filming this and has a comfortable lead over Kevin Benkenstein of South Africa. Sticking with Epic Ride, kind of, uh, Matt and Sai have got some news for you, so we'll hand over to them right now. Really sorry that me and Sai couldn't be in this week's GCN show. Yeah. We're actually out panic training because in around a month's time, we're taking part in the KOM Challenge in Taiwan, which is basically a 105 kilometer hill climb. Yeah. We start out at sea level, then we wind our way up to the summit of Taiwan's highest road pass which is 3,275 metres. But, so it's not all that bad, because the first 20k, yeah. well, the average gradient there was only 2%. Okay. And then the next 75 kilometres, well, that's only a mere 6%. 75 kilometres at 6%? Yeah. Yeah, what are we worried about, mate? Well, actually, come to think of it, the last 9.5 kilometres, well, it averages between 10 and 22%. Okay, all right. I'm worried about that. I'm also worried about so the fact I. that we're lining up against Vincenzo Nibali, Cadell Evans, and Emma Pooley. Oh, we won't need to worry about those guys for too long, mate. We're going yeah. all right. We are going all right. We also, we've got two secret weapons, Matt. Have we? I couldn't help but notice, there's no weight restriction on the KOM challenge. So we've got two very special factor bikes with lightweight wheels and THM components. Boom! I can't see us being beat. No way. Bring Stick on that in nibs. Your pipe and smoke it nibbly. Got no chance, have they? No. no chance. I'll tell you what, lastly, I hope for their sakes that there is no time limit at the Taiwan KOM Challenge. And for our sakes as well, we want them to let our good name down, really, no. would we? What I also hope, Dan, is that there aren't any farmers there. You what? Did you not read the article in the Irish Independent? No. Two farmers dressed in flat caps and tweed jackets. You mean, you mean two farmers dressed up as farmers, lastly? Yeah, two farmers <laughs> dressed up as farmers attempted to disrupt a race in Scotland. They stood in the middle of the road, brandishing sticks, trying to block the riders going through. Oh, goodness. You get all sorts out there these days, don't you? Well, let's hope that our Mark Beaumont doesn't come across any such farmers either. He now well and truly has the end in sight, the end being Paris, almost 80 days now after he started. So let's check in with him to find out the latest. 
Hello GCN, uh, quick catch up from the road on the Artemis World Cycle. This is day 65 and um, I'm, I've made it to Wisconsin. So yeah, pretty significant because um, well, I've dropped from Canada into the US now, I've crossed the prairies. I was hoping the prairies would be my fastest miles. I had three or four days absolutely battering into a headwind. There was a day there where I did shy of 200 miles in 16 hours. I mean, you can do the sums, it was brutal. And um, But then, you know, it switched around and there was two days where I pushed 270 miles each day. So um, the margin of error is getting less and less. Obviously, I'm going to come in pretty close to the 80 days. Keep in mind, the current world record is 123 days. I'm trying to get around the planet 18,000 miles in less than 80. So, um, yeah, if you're... Um, if you're wanting to follow the day to day and see how it's get going, then um, obviously I'm on Strava, strava.com uh, forward slash Mark Beaumont. And the main site, so you can actually see the tracking map and you can see progress and all the other media is uh, artemisworldcycle.com. So, um, yeah, thanks for the support, GCN. You know what, Dan? I still can't get my head around what Mark's doing. It's no. absolutely incredible. We've said it before and we will no doubt say it again, but what he is doing is, quite frankly, mind-boggling you wouldn't catch me going anywhere near something like that uh, one record that was already broken last week was the juggler jog record I see I'm sure we saw that the, the what John O'Groats to Land's End and back what a popular record in the UK although traditionally done it the other way around uh, the record was broken by a certain James McDonald and we understand that by the Guinness World Record rules it is allowed to do it in reverse he covered the 1850 miles in five days 18 hours and three minutes taking a clear three hours off the previous record which has stood for seven years so well done to you James yeah well done James and a bit of racing news now we're gonna have to start off with some bad news which is that Orca Scott's incredibly popular backstage pass yeah. series is unfortunately coming to an end the man behind Behind it, Dan Jones is taking a step away from the team in order to spend more time for his family. I think this is a bit of a loss for cycling fans, well, all cycling fans really. I always found the videos to be emotional, informative, but more than anything, just really good fun to watch. Well, yeah, most definitely, and I don't doubt that the fan base of Orica Scott wouldn't be anywhere near what it is without those backstage pass videos. So thank you very much to Dan Jones. Uh, you did a great job there. Two more people who are leaving our sport, uh, at least as professional riders, are Andrew Talansky, who announced his surprise retirement at the age of just 28 from the Cannondale Draftback team, and his former teammate, Tyler Farrar, uh, who's a little bit older, but he says that he is now ready for life outside of cycling. So good luck to both of you moving forward as well. There was, however, some absolutely fantastic news for Talansky's now former team, Cannondale Drapak. Swedish firm Education First, who are all about teaching people how to communicate, have come on board as the main naming sponsor for the team from January 1st, 2018. And with that, we understand that the team have been able to retain the services of their three stars, Rigoberto Aran, Seth Van Mark and Michael Woods. Yeah, that was great news and a big relief, wasn't it? Long live the Argyle Army. Cheers. Cheers, Dan. Last week, we had a tech overload for you. This week, however, it's not hack or botch. It may well look like that, but we have got some treats for you, mainly from Kickstarter. First up is the FlexiSpot Desk Size Pro. Now, this is actually getting very close to its funding target of $50,000. It's essentially an exercise bike with a desk built in, so you can work out while you work. Sounds pretty cool to me. Might even ask the boss if I can have one. Next up, it's the bike umbrella. Now, according to them, cycling always gets complicated on rainy days. Essentially, this product does exactly what a rain jacket does, although there is a mount for your bike umbrella as well, so you can take it wherever you go. I could have done with that on the ride to work this morning, when it absolutely chucked it down with rain. Moving on from Kickstarter to this, the Sada folding bike. It also goes down so small, it can fit inside of a rucksack. Granted, there is a bit of work to do on this as well, and the designers have even said that, but it certainly looks, well, interesting, doesn't it? Would you have one? Let us know in the comments down below. Back to Dan and Tom in the lovely Alta Badia. I could just dream of that. Believe it or not, we had a, an amazing view when we sat down to record the GC show. It's taken us a long time last, isn't it? Right, let's crack on with racing news. And on Friday, Peter Sagan took the 100th victory of his career over at the Grand Prix Quebec in Canada. In a repeat result of last year, he got the better of Greg Van Avermaet in an uphill sprint to the line. Yeah, so with his 100th win, it's interesting to use pro cycling stats as feature where you can compare riders' victories at certain ages to other riders. So. 
Mark Cavendish, at the same age as Sagan, had 93 victories. Tom Bonin had 65, and Marcel Kittel had 60. So I'm not sure whether we needed concrete proof that Sagan is a class bike rider, but there it is. Yeah, well, it puts it into context, doesn't it? A couple of days later, Diego Ulissi, the Italian rider, took the first ever one day world tour race victory of his career by winning the Grand Prix Montreal. Uh, he was part of a six man group which went clear in the closing stages and in a well timed sprint he got the better of Hazus Harada and an informed Tom Yelta Slagter. Thomas de Ghent finally took a Grand Tour stage win at the Vuelta Espana yeah, as well. On stage 19 he took a win from the break and afterwards he tweeted oh, this. Yeah, I did 40 stages in the Grand Tours this year, 15 stages I was in the break. I win the last attempt. I wish someone could have told me that. Yeah, yeah we did like that, didn't we? <laughs> uh, it didn't come without its cost, though. Uh, later, he also tweeted a picture, which we'll show you shortly. There is no doubt that when he takes a well-earned holiday at the end of this season, he's going to stand out from the crowd. Take a look at this. That man needs a long pair of swimming shorts. Yeah. Matteo Trentin rounded out a fine Vuelta Espana for himself and for his quick step team with a win on the final day in Madrid. That took his total to four stage wins at the race and the team's total to six stage wins. However, Trentin's four wins weren't quite enough to deliver him the overall and the points, Jim. No, no, they weren't. Uh, the previous day was all about one man, that being, of course, Alberto Contador. The script was kind of written for that stage before it even started. And unlike his bestie, Matt Stevens, he was able to stick to the script. Uh, he took a very famous and very popular win up the infamous Anglerou climb. And as such, as you can probably guess, he is this week's What It Bazooka! Meanwhile, this week's viewer wattage bazooka was nominated by Phil Tromans, and it goes to 14-year-old Tom Pugh Morgan who recently Everested by climbing a hill called Ditchling Beacon, which is in the south of England, 65 times. Oh my goodness. Wow. Well done to you, Tom. That's all I can say. Uh, if you would like to nominate anyone for next week's show, you just need to use the hashtag WattageBazooka on social media, and we shall pick our favourite next week. On to the Tour of Britain now, and that was won for a second time by Lars Bone, the Dutchman. Uh, he had dominated the individual 16km time trial to take the race lead, and he and his team valiantly defended that all the way through to the finish. At the Lotto Belgian Tour, Anuska Costa took the overall win following a very powerful and very brave attack on the final stage. So she not only took the stage win, she also got the overall. At the Madrid Challenge, Belgian champion Jolien Dor outsprinted Corinne Rivera for the sprint. At that very same race, Anna van der Breggen also wrapped up the overall in the Women's World Tour, despite not actually taking part in the race. Such was her dominance earlier in the season. Mm, and before we finish with racing news this week, we're going to have to give a shout out to one Annie Lars, sister of the brick here. Uh, we normally leave these results to our friends over at the Global Mountain Bike Network, but Annie picked up a fine silver medal at the Elite Women's Cross Country World Championships over in Cairns at the weekend. Uh, Yolanda Neff took the win there, and it was Pauline Ferron Prevost who finished behind Annie in third place. Quite remarkable indeed. And I think from this point onwards, Lassie, I'm afraid you'll be known as the brother of Annie. That's good. It's better than the outtake where you call me the sister of Annie. Yeah, that is true. The view is back and it's time for hack forward slash bodge of the week and first up this is a classic it was spotted by Daniel Hawthorne so it's not Daniel's bike but he sent it into us on Facebook. Wow. Where to start Dan? Well I mean that does look very aero on the chain stays, seat stays and top tube. He hasn't put so much attention to detail on the down tube. But I don't, I don't know what the fairings made out of. No. Is it like plastic or something? Uh, what you like lastly is the fact that the chain goes through the fairing at the back. I just think the attention to detail there is next level. It's a hack from me. Well, it's a hack from me as well. That thing does look remarkable. Uh, next up, Jonathan Hall. Uh, he tried to use his dad's old mud guards for his uni commuter bike, but the front one didn't fit because of the disc brake calipers. Uh, so he's put an old ass saver on there. And I think that looks particularly neat, I have to say. Very clean bike thus far. I don't think he's done so much commuting yet. So hack or bodge? Hack. I was going to give it a bodge. A bit... Well, you decide. There we go. Niels Petermans has made a bike-shaped pinata. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's got to be a hack, isn't it? Definite, definite hack, Niels. Definite <laughs> hack. Uh, right, next up, we have this one from Mark van Suchtelen. Uh, he has sent in this, where he has decluttered his front end by using some Velcro to mount his Campagnola EPS junction box. That is definitely a hack from me. That, that is cool. Neat. That is cool. But I just want to draw your attention to the number of spacers underneath the stem, Dan. Oh dear, yeah, maybe you should have cropped that. Okay, anyway, next up from the Dandy Narwhals, 
who arrived on a bike trip to Albania with a broken seat post and bodged it by wedging what looks like two bits of Allen key underneath oh, yeah. the rails. They said they cut it down too, so presumably that worked. Apparently it held. It's a bodge, isn't it's it? It's a bodge, but that's what Stone you need in that bodge, sort of situation. Good. Just a bodge to get you through. True. Uh, Justin Hemming, well, this is a real bodge, surely. Seen on Facebook, hashtag GCN hack. Uh, it looks like a tow bar from a car used as a pedal. You could probably get away with it, couldn't you? But it's definitely a bodge. 100% bodge. Finally, Riley Pigeon sent this one in, who said, Oh, wow. Got a few of these Sephora mascara brushes while shopping with my girlfriend. Good brand, that's Sephora. Good brand. Turns out they're actually quite useful for cleaning the bits in between your chain. Yeah, well, if you want to go the extra mile in chain cleaning, that looks like the brush for you, doesn't it? It certainly does. That's next level attention to detail. That's a hack for me. Right, if you've got any hacks or bodges that you would like to send us ready for next week's show, all you've got to do is use the hashtag GCNHack on Twitter or Instagram. Competition time now, and as you'll be well aware, we've had some amazing competitions for you recently. Uh, so numerous are the winners that we are going to have them rolling across the screen as opposed to reading them out. So the names that you see now are the five lucky winners of the physique competition, each of whom have won their choice of physique shoes and saddle. We also had a Zwift competition with the Zwift Academy, where we had 10 indoor trainers up for grabs. Registration for the Zwift Academy is open to all and is open until September the 15th, and there could also be two pro team places up for grabs as part of that. Yeah, that's an opportunity of a lifetime, is it? Make sure that you do do that. Uh, the five names now scrolling across the screen are the winners of the Tax Neo, and once they've finished, about now, the next five names are the winners of the Wahoo Kicker Snap. Well done to all of you. Finally, for winners this week, the winner of the Cask Protoni helmet is Innes Browning. All our competitions haven't quite closed yet, so if you'd like to win a new Watt Bike Atom, there is a link to enter that competition down in the description. Yeah, and the winner of the Lightweight Wheels competition is going to be announced next week, sorry. Caption of the week now, and last week's photo was this. Yeah, and we have a winner, and that winner is Ed Markey with caption, Siri, where did I leave my helmet? Uh, well done to you, Ed. Get in touch with us on Facebook with your address, and we'll get a GCN Camelback water bottle out to you ASAP. This week's photo is this one of Peter Sagan, and if you don't mind, Dan, I'm going to start. I've got some too, but yeah, you get started. Okay, thanks, thanks. So, my caption is, Peter Sagan, clearly pumped with his 100th pro victory. Very good, very good. I've got a couple of songs. Oh, First up, great. Don't you know, pump it up. You've got to pump it up, don't you, etc. Uh, and also, pump up the jam, pump it up. Whilst your feet are pumping, over there, the jam is pumping, etc. etc. as well. If you can do better than that, which I very much doubt you can, you can leave your captions in the comment section just down below. I just, I just can't imagine you being beaten. Please do comment with your efforts, yeah, though. Please stay for the rest of the show, Lassie. Please stay. <laughs> Coming up on the channel this week, on Wednesday we are going to show you how to utilise your summer cycling form for some events in the fall. Now when you do start racing, a cross event lasts between about 40 minutes to an hour. So if you're coming off a good summer of riding and racing, then actually the duration will be no problem to you. So instead, to convert that summer form to cross form, you need to concentrate on two things. Short, sharp, intense efforts and your technique. Uh, Thursday, we've got our top five cycling tantrums. No! And on Friday, as ever, it is Ask GC Anything. On Saturday, we take a look at Rowan Dennis's time trial bike because he builds up for the time mm. trial world. On Sunday, we've got a very cool factory tour. And on Monday, it's a maintenance video where Sai takes a look at the impact of STEM setup. Yeah, now on Tuesday, it is once again the GCN show, and once again, from Outer Badia. Look at the view. It's getting better, isn't it? From the top of the A27 overbridge in Flavorland, Holland, at 2,200 millimetres above sea level, welcome to the GCN show. Uh, right, well that brings this week's GCN show to a close. We hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please give it the thumbs up just down below. Great to have Lasty back, I think you will agree. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please now click on the globe, and that is exactly what you will do for free. And if you'd like to check out a couple of videos, I thoroughly recommend Dan's Top 5 Cycling Rivalries Part 2, which is right there. And also, as it's the start of the cyclocross season, why not check out a masterclass from the master, Sven Nace, right there. There's also a link to our shop on screen, so click there too. <laughs>